Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the virtual stage of the San, of the Lawrence Family JCC Jacobs Family Campus. Uh, tonight's event is a presentation of the San Diego International Jewish Film Festival. My name is Ryan Isaac. I am the Director of Cultural Arts at the San Diego Center for Jewish Culture. We are lucky tonight to be joined by filmmaker Aviva Kempner. Uh, Viva's film, The Spy Behind Home Plate, screened just this past February at our most recent film festival. And she is working on a film right now called Imagining the Indian. It deals with racist sports mascots and I think is as timely as ever. Um, that said, thank you all for joining us. Uh, as we continue to stay inside and socially distance, the JCC continues to provide uh, programming like this. I do want to thank the underwriters of our Arts and Ideas programs and of the Film Festival. It's through their generosity that we are able to continue to program even during the temporary closure of our facility. Uh, temporary, I will add though that there is preschool happening again, so we are trending in the right direction. Uh, that again, Zoom protocol, just to touch on a few things. It's nice to see so many faces. This might be a record for us in terms of people with video on. Maybe it has to do with the time of day. Uh, good afternoon to everybody still with us on the West Coast and good evening to our friends in DC. Uh, again, Aviva Kempner joins us tonight. Aviva is the founder of the Cheshla Foundation. It is a uh, organization that produces documentaries that explore the non-stereotypical images of Jews uh, Aviva is a social justice warrior, and like I said a little while ago, her upcoming film, Imagining the Indian, uh, deals with some of the racist sports mascots. Aviva, um, I know we have a trailer to show folks. Would you like to discuss the film a little bit first, or do you want me to get right into the trailer? Yeah, let me do an intro. Okay, well, um, thank you for joining us, and welcome, Aviva. Yeah, thanks for having me. First of all, um, I don't think we have time to do eight and a half minutes, but I think our prayers and our thoughts are with the George Flood family, and today was the burial, and uh, I'm proud that in the Rosenwald film was dedicated to Black Lives Matter, and this new film will be too. Actually, I have three new films, but we'll talk about that one now. Uh, it turns out that way before, for 40 years, I've been making films about underknown Jewish heroes fighting isms either racism or Nazism, McCarthyism, sexism. And, but way before I became a filmmaker, thanks for the DC bar for flunking me, uh, when it came to the bar exam, I was doing Native American rights. I was in a VISTA volunteer in New Mexico. And there I got very involved with uh, different activists and different Native American causes. And when I was in law school, um, one summer I worked at the Department of the Interior. And then I did some legal work or, and worked with two national uh, Native American organizations. So um, their cause, I learned a lot working with Native Americans and I was very involved um, in that community, even though I went and uh, as I say, I sort of found my Jewish soul as a child of a Holocaust survivor. I went and made the first film, uh, Partisans of Vilna, Jews Fighting Nazis. Um, it was always deep in my heart to go back and do something on a Native American theme. And several years ago, I wrote a script called Casus, which is about a Navajo activist I worked very closely with and died in a shootout with the, after he kidnapped the mayor of Gallup. And you may have been hearing a lot about the Navajo reservation in Gallup because unfortunately the virus is, is really decimated uh, that uh, territory. And separately from that, as I was finishing uh, Mo Berg, uh, Kevin Blackstone, who's an ESPN, uh, resp uh, um, he, he's, he's a commentator on ESPN, sports commentator, and also writes for the Washington Post, and a friend came to me and he said, listen, we've got to make a film about Native American mascotting and the worst being negative mascotting and the worst being for the Washington football team. They're called the Redskins. So I said, yes, I'd love to join in, but I'd like to include my the co-writer for my Kasu script, um, Ben West, who Cheyenne and had gone to uh, film school and we worked very well together. So four years later, we we're just coming out with uh, the website just this weekend, uh, the trailer, which is going to play 
and talk about timing because so much of the issue is racism. And it just happened that AOC, you know, the Congresswoman from Queens just um, tweeted about how that has to change. So we'll play the three minutes now of the, the film that it isn't completed, but we're, we're now doing some more filming and raising money to finish it. I pity the country I pity the state And the mind of a man Who thrives on hate I went to public school through ninth grade And I never learned a single thing that made me proud of my ancestors There were times where I was ashamed of my skin color because I thought that we were just lower class and that's what I was taught. We are here today to protest the Washington NFL use of the R word. It's just a football team. It's a slur. It's a racial, derogatory, disparaging slur. The original sin occurred the minute Europe touched native shores in North America and South America. There was a bounty paid on the scalps of men, women, and children. In the 100 years that followed the arrival of Europeans, the population was reduced by over 90%. This legacy of genocide and the attitudes that sit behind it are in every Native person's mind as he or she, even in the 21st century, looks at the name of sports teams and the denigration that is often reflected and the mascots associated with them. When you think of a brave or a warrior, do you think of somebody who is the director of a museum? Do you think of somebody who runs a tribe that runs multi-million dollar industries? Of course you don't. The images that we do have are these fictionalized, stereotyped characters. It dehumanizes human beings. Mascots, stereotypes of Native people lower the self-esteem of Native youth. It's as much of a slur as it would be to call the team the Darkies. Now, how many Americans would allow that to stand? For me as a black person, if we don't want to be called niggas, then I can't be talking about no Redskins. And then the hypocrisy of being in the nation's capital, Chocolate City, a city that's majority black, for us to root on a team called the Redskins, it's very deep psychologically. There has been a great deal of success in our movement to end these offensive images in sports. Across the country, you've seen high schools and colleges and other groups change the name. It's just an NFL is a problem organization. You know, this country doesn't really do anything voluntarily in terms of granting human rights. It comes through movements, and movements educate people. I'm really hopeful with the Gen Zs. I think the Gen Zs are a generation that have grown up with a lot of social change. They're very open to social change. We may be your doctor, your lawyer, your professor. When they're running the country in 20, 30 years, the Parkland generation and those like them, they are not going to allow these kinds of things to continue because they're American, a very different, open-minded country. And there's just no room in that picture. We need the truthful history told about the strength and resilience of the people that exist and that are still here, both non-native and native. So um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So we're very proud that the Yokudi Nation, which is actually a tribe uh, near Sacramento, that's the executive producer that have helped us along 
up until now, and now we're seeking funds from others. I mean, they're a casino tribe, so obviously they haven't been operating, uh, to say the least, at full steam. Um, I'm very proud to do it because, like I said, I had the whole legacy of doing work um, since I was 20 uh, uh, with Native Americans. The other issue is, for me, if you see briefly a picture of a man who owns the Washington football team, which is the name that a lot of us call it because we think it's unacceptable to call it by um, its current name. Um, uh, Dan Schneider happens to be Jewish. And there's a history in Washington where uh, Abe Poland, who's a Jewish owner of the basketball team, switched the name from the Bullets to the Wizards because there have been so many murders on the street. And the Lerner family, this wonderful family that took over and brought baseball here, uh, agreed to the distinction of calling it, we used to be called the Senators, the baseball team, but we are now called the Nationals because in fact, we don't have voting rights. We do not have Senators and they agree to that. So I'm just hoping that Dan Schneider pick, uh, you know, steps up to the plate and changes the name. He has said he'll never change it. Um, and there's a poll that he, he um, what do you call it? often sites that we, we think is very suspect. Anyhow, you can go to the website, Imagining the Indian, and if you know any people that want to support the film, because it's a 501c3 making it. And actually there's a San Diego connection. One of the people you saw speaking is uh, Professor Jolie Pruitt. She talks about uh, the basis of the name being from Bounty. She has a blue dress and she lives in the San Diego area. So when I was last in San Diego filming, uh, I saw her there, or, or presenting my film. And so we're very proud of that. And you know, what's, real, what's fascinating is how everything sort of comes together. And of course it's come to a head um, in terms of racism and especially racism practiced uh, by uh, law enforcement. But you know, the Native American population is so much smaller, but it's just what Christine Brennan says um, in, the, in the trailer, which we're seeing every night, it is the Gen Z's, it's the new generation, white and black. And if you want to email us at Imagining the Indian, I'd love to know, we'd love to know of any examples of high schools or junior highs or even colleges that are changing their name. And I'm a big baseball person. And I don't know if you've ever seen the Braves play and what they do. They have this, uh, this horrible, um, practice of doing a tom tomahawk chop at the games. And it's only this last round, which by the way, the Nats went all the way to the World Series. As a matter of fact, I have my little shark right here. Um, seriously, uh, uh, a baseball player, a Native American baseball player, pitcher on the uh, St. Louis Cardinals, they were playing, about to play the Braves and a player said something stepped up to the plate. It didn't quite kneel, but um, I think there's a lot of activism all over the country and a lot more justification for it and acceptance. And so we're very excited about, you know, making this film. We have several Congress people and we're hoping to get, you know, I'm a filmmaker and I use film, old film all the time, usually to just make a point, you know, if you saw the Mo Berg film, you know, he was, no one was shooting him spying, but there's great spy movies, but it's a little different with Imagining the Indian because most of the portrayals of Native Americans is so stereotyped. When the, you know, Hollywood has made it, it's a lot different now when Native American filmmakers come in and portray their people. And then of course we make the whole point that, you know, we're not all, you know, the Braves with the whole, you know, I mean, half the symbols that they use at these games have nothing to do with Native American life today. So uh, again, uh, our biggest challenge, I don't know if any filmmakers are watching tonight, is how do you, how do you film? I mean, besides of course raising the money, is how do you film people if um, you can't, you know, the social distancing. So um, Zoom cameras or getting people to be there and uh, my co-director, Ben West, is in LA. I'm here. So these, these are the meetings we're having this week to continue production. Aviva, how much might change for your film given the current social climate? What, 
I know it's it's a work in progress still. Do you do you see a lot of wiggle room, or could could the story change while you're producing it? That's what we want. It's changing every day. Um, I think there's going to be stepped up. I think what's happening and justifiably and outstandingly happening in terms of making the uh, law enforcement accountable for these horrendous practices and murders is we're going to start looking at other places in society. And in fact, there's a a lot of high schools, uh, the young people have organized and changed the names. It's more like the professional sports. And in fact, the Cleveland Indians got rid of one of their symbols um, in terms of being on the field, Chief Wahoo, but not in terms of it's still on the uniform. So, you know, it's all a process. And what we'll do is we'll film up until the film is finished. And then we'll just continue on again, imagining the Indians. You know, the, the good thing about websites is you can have video on it and continue, you know, we're covering the news and what's happening. But then again, maybe we'll help make the news. I mean, that's what we hope. That's great. What are your hopes? I know what your hopes are. What are your expectations locally out of the Washington football team, given that the NFL is historically slow? Oh, slow, but, slow might be generous. But it's very important, even though he made a big faux pas. But the commissioner of football this week, on his own volition, you know, football's about to start. And he realized that 70% of his, uh, of the players are African American, said that we have not been responsive enough to what's happening and we're sorry. Of course, the, the man who first kneeled and really made this an issue, Cap, he never mentioned his name, which is kind of weird because of course everyone said, well, it's great, Goodell, you said this, but who did you forget to say? And I'm just praying that we can actually have an interview with Cap. And, you know, a lot of the players who, who said these kind of things years ago, you know, when I was in college, I don't know if you remember the Olympics and in, Mexi in Mexico, where uh, two of the play, uh, two of the Olympics put their hands up. I had, I had that picture on my wall and Robert Kennedy, RFK's picture for years on my wall. And, and I always laugh because I tell people, if you were to tell me at 20, I would wind up making three sports films, I would have laughed because I'm actually kind of a geek, political, intellectual. However, sports, it's never a, a solid sports film. Hank Greenberg has so much to do with anti-Semitism and what was happening to American Jews and how, you know, counting the stereotype of the Nebuchadnezzar Jewish male and a lot, my dad's for a story. And Mo Berg is so much about spying and, you know, what we try to do in the Manhattan Project. But in fact, this is my third baseball movie. And not baseball, but sports. But I'd like to talk about the other two because they're also socially oriented. Please do. Okay, so uh, I, I won't be able to see everyone's hand up, but how many, uh, how many women have to go to the bathroom a lot? <laughs> and the older we get, see, I'm not gonna drink much water or you won't have me for the whole episode. So I also have in all my education, a master's in urban planning. So, uh, and up until recently, I always said I was a Jewish dropout because I didn't have a PhD, but I did get an honorary degree from UDC here. And I, it always amazes me all the times I went to lobby in Congress that when they first designed the congressional buildings, they never thought a woman would be a Senator or they never thought someone would be in the House of Representatives. So they never built female bathrooms over each, you know, each, um, you know, the main buildings where people, uh, the main halls where people, you know, legislate and um, have, you know, big fights and decide bills. So it was only in the 60s when women con congressional leaders got together and they fought for what I call potty parity to fight against this exclusionary uh, architecture. So I'm now making a film and raising money for what I call pissed off. And uh, I was hoping to get it done this year, the hundredth anniversary of, um, you know, the women's right to vote. But I anticipate it'll be done by next year. It'll be a short and there'll be some Jewish speakers in it. And I'm hoping it, then it'll be ready for the first, uh, the year of the first female vice president. Need I say more? 
So, um, and I don't know if any of you have ever seen Hidden Figures, but it was that film too that, and I just recently resaw it, where the African American sign uh, mathematician had to run to the bathroom and back to be able to go because of discrimination. And uh, Barbara Mikulski is the is the first woman who organized it. Of course, I want to get the speaker of the house, but she's a little busy right now, so um, I'll have to figure out a way. I'm going to. We're also having meetings this week, uh, how we'll film it. At least that's a meeting, a subject that I'll film mostly here. Although some of the congresswomen and s female senators have, um, what do you call it, retired. So how many, how many projects do you keep running at once? Uh, well, there's a morning project, there's an afternoon project, it's a night project. Well, a lot of it is funding the status, but let me tell you, uh, the mensch of mentions who part-time lives in San Diego is William Levine. He's the one that supported the making of Mo Berg, inspired me to make it. Al although I will say he first came to me and wanted me uh, to make a film on the Jewish uh, football player, Sid Luckman. And I said, Bill, I don't do football. And then he said, well, what about Barney Ross, the boxer? And I said, that's even worse. But then he said, Mo Berg. So Bill lives part-time in San Diego. And just recently, in recent months, he said to me, why don't you uh, do a film on Ben Hecht? So is there any way we can see people raising their hands? No, because I'm just curious. As much as I thought I knew, I did not know his name was not in my everyday um, life. But this is a man who was first a great journalist in Chicago as well as a columnist, which is interesting because during the Rosenwald film, I spent so much time in Chicago and then morphed into being a great screenwriter. Um, he, Notorious has to be one of the best World War II movies, spy movies. Um, he did the original Scarface. He did the, touch, the last touches on Gone with the Wind. He wrote uh, Marilyn Monroe's um, Ghost wrote her autobiography. One of the great playwrights, he did um, a screwball comedies and mysteries, et cetera. And oftentimes with Charles McCarthy, who was the husband of Helen Hayes. So, and he was born Jewish, but didn't really identify, oh, good, um, with, um, uh, what do you call it? With, I gotta take this off my screen. Okay, with um, being Jewish until in the early 40s, Hillel Cook slash Peter Berkson came to him and said, listen, we've come from Palestine. There are known records now that 2 million Jews have died, uh, have been murdered. As a matter of fact, that fact was buried on like page eight in the bottom of New York Times. And we, not, we need to do some activism. So as he says, he found his Judaism then. And they staged pageants in 43 and 44, in uh, Hollywood Bowl, in Washington, D.C., in New York, to try to get FDR and others to get more Jews into America. And those efforts um, manifested into the War Refugee Board. And in fact, 200,000 Jews were saved but what not enough. And all the great actors performed in it, especially out of the Yiddish theater and Kurt Weill uh, composed the music. And we may even, I've been just talking to Zalman Mlotek who, run, who uh, put together the, I don't know if you all saw the Yiddish um, Fiddler on the Roof and we're trying to uh, very much um, try to restage what it was to see a pageant that said, hey, we got to save European Jewry. But that wasn't enough. The next year, Heck did a similar thing where he really hit in the British because they weren't letting Jews go into Palestine. He was such a nunnik, as my late father would say, nunnik, a pain in the you know, butt or uh, tush, that the British were so upset with him, they boycotted his films that he wrote. He wasn't blacklisted during the McCarthy period. He was blacklisted because he really made a stink that the British weren't letting Jews into Palestine. So he's a real unsung he hero uh, and it's a Berkson group. And um, I'm very excited about doing that. And it's sort of interesting, I'm just starting an autobiography. The president head of J Street is Jeremy Benami, 
but it was his father that was part of that group who tried everything they could to make sure that we knew. Now it's very different today. You know, we, we worked very hard. I remember marching here for Russian Jewry, you know, Soviet Jewry was happening in Israel. But back then, partly because we were at war and partly we just, we didn't know. And Michael Birnbaum, who's, you know, the incredible uh, Holocaust scholar said to me, and he faith, faith, put it this way, it's when you knew and what did you do about it? And so this is going to be quite an amazing film. It won't be out until, you know, next year. So um, I'm spending my weekends looking at old movies. Uh, you know, I have this thing that always to have the Marx Brothers in my movies. So uh, luckily TCM just played all these Marx Brothers movies. So it turns out that Ben Heck, when he was young, his father bought him all the classics and he went through them just like that. So when he went to start at Wisconsin, because he was growing up in Racine, he only lasted a week and ran away to Chicago. So the Marx brother, Horse Feathers, has all these university scenes. So I'm gonna use that. Although I have to say Duck Soup is the most anarch, anarch uh, like an anarchy comedy. If, if you wanna get through this period, watch some Marx Brothers. Aviva, you, you brought up those two questions, when you knew and what did you do about it? Uh, it's obviously part of what motivates you as a filmmaker. What do you think, or how, how does it change now today for, for all of us on this call and how we reckon with the current, reckon the current events and uh, you know, moving forward even either for uh, thinking about imagining the Indian and the racist sports, sports mascots and what that represents. Uh, is that representative of the movement as a whole right now? Well, you know, um, I think I'm motivated by several things. Most foremost, being the child of a Holocaust survivor from my immediate mother, she passed as a Polish Catholic in Germany. Um, and my grandparents died in Auschwitz, which is why the foundation is named Czeszla. And uh, my dad's um, mother was also murdered. He was a US Army soldier. That's where he met my mother in Berlin. So this whole thing of being born in that legacy and feeling responsibility to tell that story. I was fascinated with in high school. And actually my mother did not talk about it. And that often happened in second generation homes where you didn't hear about it or you heard too much about it. So I think that was my responsibility to tell these stories. Um, but the second thing is how the visual can help you change. I mean, that young woman, and I, I'm forgetting her name, who took the footage of George Floyd being murdered. I mean, that's the footage they likened it in the paper the other day to, uh, you know, our uh, Kennedy being assassinated in Dallas. That, you know, we as filmmakers, I feel have a real responsibility to use our art and our craft and our storytelling to say, listen, usually for me, it's always been, this is in the past and let's hope it doesn't repeat. Um, this is the first film I'm doing in real time, you know, what's happening now or what immediately happened. Although I can also talk about my fourth project, which is my political work. As I said, DC is considered a territory, oftentimes in the, in the Republic, by the Republican Party. They don't want us to have votes in Congress because there'll be two senators. And it's pretty well known that we're a town of mostly Democrats. So the first bill that was passed about the virus we were labeled a territory, even though we pay more in taxes here than 22 states out of the 50 states. We were denied $755 million because of that. So we're trying to fight that. And I came up with the idea to these little Vimeos. I'm trying to interview, if any of you know any relatives of ex-presidents in either party trying to say something, or people who grew up here, especially actors, people who played any parts in Hollywood that were set in Washington, like I just invited Kerry Washington, and people who played sports here. Uh, I'm trying to assemble all these little Vimeos to say, hopefully by Flag Day, where I'm gonna, I, I should have it behind me. I have a flag that has 51 states on it. And you know, we, we, you know, I've lived here since 73, and there's no capital in the world that's um, treated like a territory or, you know, second-class citizens than Washington is in the world. 
you, you have a variety of projects of Eva, but there's that constant theme. When, when you wake up in the morning, are you always heading in the same direction or does it just depend on, on the meetings you have or the, which, when the proposal is due, you know, who's getting me first? Uh, you know, it, it just depends. I mean, um, like I said, we probably would be um, we're done with all the shooting on imagining the Indian and we would just be editing. And then I thought, well, then I'll be shooting hacks. So uh, things sort of interfered. Um, but you know, this is the, our new reality. Um, so we need to just, you know, adjust to that. Um, the other thing is trying to be helpful to other filmmakers and see what they're doing, which just reminds me, um, there's a new film on resistance called Four Winters. Were you sent, are you, did you schedule that? Or are you going to have that? Did no, you? but we're, we're taking notes on everything that we'll be able to send yeah, out to, to everyone here later. And, that'll, and then that'll be part uh, of for all of you who have Netflix, I think it's important to see Unorthodox. I think it's an incredible series that made a big difference. But I'll tell you, I just watched the best Netflix series I've seen at all. But of course, I'm not remembering the last part of the name. Um, let me, I'm sorry, I'm going to put this in front of the screen for a minute so I can get the name. Is it keep on? Yeah. The, it's called The Bonfire of Destiny. It's a combination of um, Les Miserables meets Delton Abbey. And this, the, you remember the uh, triangle shirtwaist fire? It's about the, a real fire that took place in the 1800s. And it's with French subtitles. I watch it with subtitles, but you can watch it dubbing. And I think it's very interesting what's happening on TV, um, that there's a lot of very exciting films that parallel what's happening in society. One problem though is that they don't, I mean, I'm still getting over the fact that Homeland is done. That was, uh, I thought, had a great ending. And I'm actually good friends with Abba Nazir. He's a Persian actor, Navid Negaban, who's doing an artist column, uh, an artist center in Los Angeles. Um, but there's a great community of filmmakers, both in this city, in this country, and around the world. And as much as possible, we try to help each other. I started the Jewish Film Festival in Washington. So I'm always trying to help Ilya with suggestions. And what I'm really concerned about, and I'm, uh, someone just sent me a study that they say the JCCs are going down. I don't know, had you all see that? Because growing up in Detroit, and certainly since I lived here, I was on the board for a while, the JCCs are really important. So primarily, you know, after you, or as, as long as, as well as helping filmmakers or artists, please help the JCCs to keep, um, to keep alive, because um, I think the combination of what, what you all do, education and health, but you know, film and plays is just so important. Whenever I go, I love it when JCCs and Jewish film festivals book me, because I always feel at home. But Thank I have a, I have a question for you. So a friend of mine said that he was in San Diego doing work. And that somewhere near San Diego is a Jewish deli where mostly Mexicans come to. That it's like a traditional old Jewish deli that's somewhere outside the city. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? I see Sandra shaking her head. No, Karen, is that a yes? Here, let's see what we can do here. Well, I'll try to get the name from him because he told me after I had left San Diego. So, um, Karen, I think you're unmuted and, and I know there's more than one person interested in this answer. Oh, you're muted again. Well, let me try okay. to get the name, but you all might know, but he said it was so fascinating because it really had real, real good traditional Jewish food, but none of the customers were Jewish. And it's like somewhere maybe closer to the border from San Diego. Karen, can you help us out? Yeah, Samson's. Samson. Do you hear me? Samson's. Okay. And where's it located? Uh, I don't know why. Sorry about that. I don't know why she was muted again, but we'll, we'll dig up all that info and share it with everyone, Aviva. And next time I'm coming out there, I want to see it. Okay. It's worth mentioning, too, that on the 
on the poll about Ben Hecht. It was a 60-40 split. 60 uh, people have heard of him. Oh, good. And uh, 40% had not. So good. there you go, Aviva. Yeah, no, it's quite a... My biggest problem is he wrote himself so many books and then there's four biographies on him and he's so prolific. But um, I'm spending too much... He's just incredible. Which of your films would you suggest we watch right now, given the times? Uh, I think Rosenwald, um, which you can order from the website, rosenwaldfilm.org. And the interesting thing about Rosenwald is that we got extra funding from the Spielberg Foundation and the Ford Foundation and the Kellogg Foundation. So we have four and a half hours of bonus features. So it's very good. You can see a lot of little vignettes that didn't make it to the film. But it's a great unknown story about Blacks and Jews and why Booker T. Washington enlisted Julius Rosenwald's support to build these 5,000 schools and why Black artisans, it was so important to get the money because it was at the time of Jim Crow. And a lot of us don't know about that. And there's such a rich culture there. So yes, I would definitely recommend Rosenwald. But of course, I love all my babies. So um, as I call them, because uh, I think Hank Greenberg, you know, really talks about next to Jackie Robinson, no one faced more catcalling on the field. I, I just don't know how Hank did it. And, you know, they're talking about people playing baseball right now, which I'm against for several reasons. Most of all, I'm worried about health for these players. Second of all, I want a full season so the Nationals can defend our title. Um, and it's interesting with Mo Berg and Hank. Hank went off for four and a half years and Ted Williams did and DiMaggio and Bob Feller. And it's just amazing. They don't have asterisks in the record books because they really sacrificed. And Mo would have been slated for sure to be a manager. He was already two years a coach and he went off to war. So I don't think any of these players um, get uh, what, you know, sort of the respect they deserve for just sacrificing for our country. And I think that's a lot what Mo, well, both Mo and Hank show too. But in terms of Gertrude Berg, I think it's the most positive portrayal. Also, we have DVDs of that with some of the shows uh, of Jewish family life and um, immigrants and, and how people can get really along, along and play with each other However, how McCarthyism destroyed careers. So, uh, and partisans of Vilna, you know, what I'm doing now is I, I'm getting a grant from the Claims Commission to restore and go back and digitize all the interviews and do a whole new uh, version in a way of the DVD and the film, because there's some interviews that never made it and we shot on film. So. Yes, I am keeping very busy, but it's also making good hires, you know, people to help you work on, you know, the different aspects of the film. So the, the same editor for Mo Berg will be doing both Imagining the Indians and Ben Hacked and Marion Hunter, who did Hank Greenberg and Rosenwald will be doing Pissed Off. I could mention one more film, but you'll probably think I'm crazy. But you have that film in mind? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, when my father was in the military government, he was a journalist, as he was in the Pacific. So there's hundreds and hundreds of photos of him covering the first Passover, the first Rosh Hashanah. And then, of course, my parents meeting and their love story and me being born. And I don't think people really, I, you know, the DP experience, which was very different from what my parents experienced in I just sort of like a love story, although it wound up in a divorce, but just, you know, more assured about visually about what life was. And I just, a relative, a cousin of mine just died and I didn't realize she had all these pictures from Munich. I, I knew the ones from Berlin. So it'll probably be another short. That'll probably be my swan, swan song. All right. I know we have a couple raised hands and some questions. Feel free to use the chat function. And you can type your questions in that way and, and we'll get them to Aviva. Um, Aviva, when you dig into the research for these documentaries, 
how often are you surprised by what you find and, and how much you come away from learning that you did not expect to, to see there? That's actually a very good question. Um, I'll never forget that, you know, when I started with the Hank Greenberg, it was the day I heard Hank died. I was opening up Partisans of Vilna and I started working on it. I never knew the story of A, that he's traded his last year. And he was the, and because of that, he faced Jackie Robinson and he was one of the few players that reached out to him. And what an ending. So that, you know, I didn't know. With Gertrude Berg, of course, I had, when I was a young, young girl, I had watched it a little. I knew, you know, what an incredible talent she was. She wrote 10,000 scripts and parenthetically, her husband typed them. But I never knew that she, her stage husband, Philip Loeb, faced a blacklist and wound up, you know, actually committing suicide. So I didn't know that ending. And of course, you know, and it so affected her career. Rosenwald, I did not know that story at all. I know a lot of the black artisans he supported, but I never knew that a Jewish man, you know, essentially started and with Booker T. Washington funded it. I mean, the whole thing was a surprise in terms of, and how rich, you know, a culture it was. And, you know, and, and the importance of those schools were really when Booker T said to um, Julius Rosenwald, who was running Sears and Roebuck, that's why he was so wealthy. He wound up giving $52 million away, which turns out to be a billion. When uh, Julius Rosenwald said, well, why don't we use, you know, Sears uh, material, uh, you know, like the Sears houses for schools. And Booker T said, no, we're going to build the schools. These are our schools for our community. And that's still so much an important issue today. Uh, and with Mo Berg, I guess I never realized the extent of his bravery. And, and sadly, how when he came back, you know, he just wasn't back into baseball and, you know, made another life for himself. But really what a difference he made in terms of saving lives and, and the importance of the Manhattan Project in terms of ending the war and that Truman never knew about it. I mean, I just can't believe, you know, that, that whole secrecy and how they got away with it. So, and now with Hecht, I mean, every day I read about him, it's another surprise. I mean, the biggest challenge is what I include or I don't include, but I'm big on bonus features. And Mo Berg, you know, I'm still trying to get it. Um, I haven't even gotten to DVD, but I, I am trying next week to go uh, to different uh, TV entities to try to get streaming or at least shown on TV. We had a documentary filmmaker a couple months ago who talked about having to remove one of his favorite scenes out of a documentary because it just didn't work with it. Uh, I imagine for you then having the bonus features, having the bonus scenes available is, is yeah. comforting and, and rewarding because you can just have it all out there somehow. Right. Although my biggest problem is, you know, modern day technology, because a lot of people aren't even, I think it's an age thing, aren't keeping their DVD players and streaming is the wave of the future. And certainly with this virus, I mean, I was just talking to Michael Tuckman, who books my films. I, I sort of do my own, in a way, own distribution. And I said, well, Michael, when are we going to go back in the theaters? We don't know. Drive-ins. Drive-ins. We're talking about it for for yeah. our film festival out here, Aviva. Yeah, well, you've got the weather. Here it's a little bit, a little bit more prob problematic. Well, I see the sun starting to set in your window there, and I know you're three hours ahead of us and have, have a lot to do. So, By the way, this painting behind me is my mother's self-portrait. She survived the war in... Um, came to, we all came to Detroit and she wound up going to art school and she became a, a wonderful uh, abstract expressionist painter. So I always like to have one of her paintings behind me. So That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us. And Aviva, yeah. thank you for your time tonight and right. uh, telling us about what's, what's on the horizon. Right. I know we're all looking forward to imagining the Indian and we wish you all the best in wrapping that up. Uh, yes, and stay safe. You know, wear those masks, social distancing. I'm completely isolated because my niece is about to give birth and I promised her 
I wanted to be around for it. So it's been an interesting period. Wonderful. Well, yeah. Mazel Tov, and thank you, and have a good evening. Laila Tov, Shainam Dong. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good night and stay safe.